Good to see you. Well, it's okay. Okay. Yeah, we. Yeah. We Perfect. So, do we are have room? Are you going to moderate it? Well. Yeah, better because I will explain it later. Okay. Cool. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna go get my. So three. Place. So we have. Felix, Kaya, Rizel, Daniela. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We will limit to five minutes each one. Okay, uh, yes, thank you. Um, can we move? Oh, we can move. Yeah, I can sit there. There you sit here. Oh, you can sit there. You want to sit there? Leah, can we sit on one, one more chair? No. Uh, Where are you sitting? Sorry. Good morning, everybody. Leah, you can. You want? Okay. okay. Perfect. Sure. We're good. We're Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, all of you, for for being here this morning. Almost. Well, 
I know that many of our us are already tired of these four days already of uh, very interesting meetings. Uh, and I hope that you have found it, uh, this IGF, um, very successful. Um, we would like to, on behalf of the OIS General Secretary, we would like to, to thank our colleagues uh, from Global Partners Digital for partnering uh, on this workshop. Um, we have uh, really a desire to resource a more inclusive uh, approach to cybersecurity capacity building. We have been trying to, over the past years, to engage more with civil society organizations, and private sector, and technical community. Of course, the governments are our main uh, stakeholders. Uh, but that actually, that's one of the reasons of why uh, we have here a uh, panel with GBD and actually invited uh, at my right, Chris Painter from the Global Commission on Cyberspace, Space, Lisa France from the US State Department, Kaya Kagli from Microsoft, uh, our colleagues from uh, Oxford, uh, uh, Caroline Weiser, Felix Barrios from uh, INCIBE, in and Leah Kaspar, who is the executive uh, director uh, from the uh, Global Partners Digital. Of course, uh, um, my, my, my colleagues, uh, Rodara and Daniela. Um, um, I will ask you, uh, I know that we have a, 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 a very nice pa very nice panel, uh, really nice uh, speakers. Uh, so I would like to, to ask each of, each of you um, to provide uh, in five minutes uh, from each of your organizations to reviews on how we can uh, make cybersecurity capacity building uh, initiatives uh, more inclusive. Uh, in, a, in a more, in a more uh, pragmatic way. So um, let's start with uh, with uh, with, with uh, Leah, if you want, and then we if we finalize like this. Sure. So. Um, Hi, everyone, and uh, my name is Leah Kasper, as uh, uh, Belisario said, um, uh, the Executive Director of Global Partners Digital, and really uh, happy to be here, and thankful for the OAS for uh, co-organizing this session. Um, I think it, it would be really interesting to get into a conversation here and get out of our kind of panel versus the audiences. So I'm just going to briefly now outline what we do um, uh, as an organization. Um, and. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm sitting here as a civil society representative and uh, very much proud of the OES and the work that we've been doing together in, in promoting this approach. Um, our work on cybersecurity capacity building is twofold. On the one hand, we work to facilitate um, meaningful engagement by non-governmental stakeholders in cyber policy development uh, at the national, regional, and global level. Um, and uh, secondly, we're we've been working on uh, developing a framework for implementing these approaches, which is issue agnostic as well as actor agnostic. So if you're interested in implementing an inclusive approach and you have, um, but you have challenges in terms of how you would go about that, uh, we've been developing a, a kind of set of questions that you might want to ask. Uh, now, I kind of want to stop there and uh, come back to the more substantive issues later on, if that's okay, Belis. Perfect, yes, okay. definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, so Felix from, from Spain, I don't know. Uh, well, we, with the Spains, we, we are doing great initiatives, actually, for those of our interested. Yesterday or today, uh, depending on the time zone, we launched a, a massive open online course uh, for a small, medium enterprises. Uh, well, a regular person can take it uh, on cybersecurity, so more than welcome to, to take it. It's totally free. Uh, so, Felix, uh, please. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Congratulations for organizing this workshop. Uh, for the Spanish government, uh, the organization uh, that I belong, is uh, very concerned about the inclusive uh, way, uh, the, the, the approach uh, from a point of view of the inclusion mm -hmm. to the cybersecurity because we are uh, dealing with uh, many challenges. We are going to talk about them in this session. And the most important uh, characteristic of these challenges is uh, we are involving a multi-stakeholders uh, environment. And so it's very important to 
uh, to be here, uh, public and private representatives, because we are talking about a very difficult uh, group of concepts. And not everybody is talking about the same things when we are talking about managing risks in information security, when we talk about cyber attacks, it's very important to understand the point of view of the others to uh, reach a good level of cooperation at international level. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Caroline. Um, my name is Caroline Weiss. I work for the Global Cybersecurity Capacity Center at the University of Oxford. Um, thank you for inviting to speak at this panel. Um, we um, have, our model is a cybersecurity capacity maturity model for nations, which we have um, applied together with our partners. Our, our partners have applied in about a total of 60 countries around the world. And the core of our methodology, um, when we go to the countries um, to collect the data for maturity assessment is our stakeholder consultations over three days where we invite various um, yeah, stakeholders who are working on issues on this re regarding cybersecurity. And we always as we emphasize to and always em emphasize and encourage and um, em yeah, emphasize as a priority that um, different stakeholder groups are um, um, participating in these groups and are able to, to provide their perspective on cybersecurity capacity. So it's a very inter, inter, like very core part of those these maturity assessments. Thank you, Caroline. Hi. With Kaya, I actually want to say that with uh, Microsoft, we'll be launching a, a critical infrastructure report in March as well uh, in Panama, <laughs> probably. <laughs> no, <I'll> hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably not. It will happen. <laughs> Fingers crossed. So I'm Kai, I'm uh, Director of Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy at Microsoft. Um, and as uh, Bailey said, we work quite a lot, I think, with all the stakeholders around this table um, in terms of cybersecurity capacity building. Um, we uh, sort of, we have found that um, the, the efforts both sort of through GFC and sort of the OES, but also efforts by the United States government at sort of the US CTI trainings um, have actually exposed us to lots of new things. So I think it's, um, I think the one thing to remember is the stakeholder, the multi-stakeholder capacity building efforts are important not just because, um, you know, people on the ground actually learn good security best practices or good practices, but uh, there, there's always a two-way exchange and lessons learned um, that um, other others in that discussion can take back and improve their own internal processes as well as sort of training going forward. Um, we we sort of try to engage on a little bit like last on several levels, um, both on country, both on regional and global. Um, and what we do is we take uh, the lessons we've learned for ourselves from both sort of getting our engineers to learn about security, but also the practices we had, and also looking at, because we have global footprint, look, looking at practices governments have put in place and see how we can um, help others sort of avoid some of the mistakes that some others might have made early on in the process. So pu we publish lots of papers uh, in the policy space, but we also publish lots of best practices and training on the technical side, so developers and technologists can um, take some of the best practices that Microsoft have its in own internal processes and apply them, you know, in their startups and going forward. But like I said, I will be quick as well. So wow, you have been great with time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so Liesel, thank you for for joining us. Actually, the State Department is one of our well, it's a member state and actually one of our of main partners. So thank you for being here today. Sure. Thank you, Billy, and thank you all for uh, um, inviting me to be on this mm -hmm. panel as well. Um, as Belly said, my name is Liesl Franz, and I'm a senior policy advisor in the Department of State's Office of the Coordinator for Cyber Issues. And as probably many of you know, we have been engaged in a number of um, uh, issues along a wide range of activities in cyberspace, and capacity building is one of the one of those activities. Um, we are strong proponents of utilizing what we call a whole of government approach, but also an inclusive approaches to our foreign policy and national security objectives 
um, and that includes our cyber um, capacity building programs in which, in which we engage. Um, it's important, I think, to note that our policies reflect that our conviction that for all nations to benefit from cyberspace, politically, economically, and socially, the Internet must remain open, interoperable, interoperable secure, and reliable. So that's the baseline for all of our capacity, capacity building efforts and the partnering that we do, promoting that vision and, 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 a, and, a base, and a base for setting the agenda. I mean, obviously, I don't have to go into the importance of the Internet for um, uh, various aspects of society and the fact that it is a great um, medium, a great mechanism, but also it, uh, we, we do see a lot of threats from a wide range of actors and that there are any number of ways to uh, address them. And it's because of that variety and that complexity and that increasing sophistication of the threats that we see and the attacks that we're seeing um, that we really need to look at it as not, look at dealing with cyber issues as not um, any one um, actor that can solve the problems, not any one solution that can uh, meet that need. And so it's important to work with any number of actors in the various, um, well, I guess, stakeholder groups, I would say, but experts and across countries. The, you know, the threats are not contained within geopolitical borders, transnational. Um, so working not only with partners within um, any country, but within organizations like the OAS, um, and with uh, those in industry and the technical community and civil society as well, we, um, we find that um, enriches all of the work that we do. Um, we see that states are one of the stewards um, or caretakers who work with st stakeholders to ensure that the internet is available to all to reap the benefits and rewards. And so that uh, is infused into our capacity building programs as well. I would just mention too quickly, um, we have over the years um, developed a, a sort of methodology but working with to, um, what we call implementers of our capacity building programs. MITRE Corporation and the Carnegie Mellon Software Engineer Institute are two um, that we work with to address um, working with nations on helping to build their uh, strategic approach to cyberspace. Um, so it's a more policy-based approach um, or, or organizational-based approach, how um, within any particular country or region um, they can uh, work in their own uh, environments to, to take on what they, what a strategic approach that works for them. And then in a more operational or technical level, uh, building sustainable national computer emergency response teams. Um, so MITRE has developed a national cyber strategy engagement plan and SEI has been the architect behind our sustainable CSIRT initiative. So that's just two examples. And we work, like as Belly said, in OAS and with many uh, other organizations uh, around the world. So I look forward to the discussion as well. Thank you, Lisa. Chris. Uh, thanks, Belly. And uh, obviously, endorse everything Liesl said. That's something uh, <laughs> when I used to uh, uh, work with Liesl, that's one of our main uh, thrusts was to capacity building was one of the core elements we were trying to do because we thought capacity building was a foundational element to really almost everything else we do. If you're trying to engender more international cooperation against things like shared threats, capacity building helps you get there because it brings people up to speed, both in terms of a technical matter, but also in terms of policy. And I think it's important you know, to think of capacity building as not this uh, monolithic thing. Uh, there are three, in my view, there are, there are three types, different types of capacity building. One is the, the kind of technical training that's done with uh, you know, law enforcement officers, certs, et cetera, which is critically important to build the skills. So I call that the skills training. The other is the, um, uh, the institutional capacity building. And this is a lot of what the OAS has done, for instance, which is uh, national strategies to make sure that you know, there's this institutional framework in, in, in different governments or uh, certs, that they actually have a national cert, which a lot of countries still don't have, but many more through the OAS and others now have them that used to have them. And I think that's important, again, to engender that global cooperation. And the third type is, is policy or policy makers. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, there's been work that's been done by, you know, in the UN system, UNIDIR, for instance, and a number of other things around the world 
that have tried to uh, get policymakers to understand some of the policy challenges here and not think of this as just a technical issue. And I think that's critically important because if, if uh, uh, you know, a lot of governments, particularly developing world governments, if they don't understand both the opportunities and risks involved and they think of this as a technical issue uh, and just outsource to the technical experts, they're not going to really deal with the core issues of national security, human rights, et cetera, that are involved in this. I think what we've done a bad job of as a community in the past is coordinating some of these efforts. Um, you know, I think uh, I used to say that we had lots of great capacity building training programs. We, at one time in the U.S. government, we tried to map them all out. It took about a year to figure out what they all are. I, I don't think it was a comprehensive list even at the end of that. Um, I, know, I know others have over time tried to do this in, in a, lot of, a lot of different forms. Uh, and I think that's important. And you want to avoid training the same three guys in the country, uh, you know, by everyone in this room training the same three people on, on the same things. So you want to, with the limited resources, make sure you, you coordinate it. The other thing I think we've not done a good job at is linking the various types of capacity building we're doing. So when we go and do the kind of technical skills-based capacity building, or when we go and do the institutional capacity building, you need to link that to the political level in countries. You need to link that to the higher governmental levels. Because there are really, I think, two goals in capacity building. One is to actually build the skill set so that they can work with us in, in handling threats and, and protect themselves and work with each other. Uh, it's not just a hub and spoke thing. It's a global community. The other, frankly, is to you know, get into the game of, uh, of understanding the policy dimensions of this and hopefully uh, endorsing the open interoperable and secure internet that we believe is important and that you don't have to make major trade-offs between those. And I think, uh, you know, if you don't have that link between what you're doing on the technical and institutional side and the political side, uh, you'll have situations where people show up at political meetings in the UN or other places having no idea that all this work is being done to try to build this capacity and no link between it. And I think that we need to do a much better job of linking between that. There's some great efforts underway. Obviously, the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise is, is one of them that tries to, uh, tries to bring this together. Uh, I think there are others as well. I think that, you know, I think as each of us, either in you know, civil society or governments do this, we should think about some of these goals of what we're trying to achieve and make sure we're also making the link uh, to the higher policy levels in the various countries we're talking to. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, with that, um, I would like to, to maybe ask uh, Leah, Caroline, and, and Kaya, uh, which are representative from the civil society, academia, and, and the private sector, uh, maybe a little bit about challenges uh, that maybe uh, you face uh, working probably uh, with governments and actually between, between you uh, between, between, yeah, between your community or with other stakeholders, uh, building this inclusive security capacity building approach, I, I think I think it will be uh, uh, very interesting to, to see your views. And of course, uh, I would like to maybe see the reaction of of Felix and, and Lisa, um, and or how we can maybe uh, what's what the the government uh, sometimes limitations or how. Uh, maybe what uh, measures are taking uh, governments to, to do this, and from the Global Commission on Cyberspace, maybe what could be the uh, some some proposal or some other 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 challenges. Um, so, Leah, if you if you want. Sure. Yes. Thank you, Belisario. Um, I think challenges is the, the, the most interesting bit. Cause, and I, I'm glad that we're having this conversation at the Internet Governance Forum. Um, before we started working on cybersecurity, I was following for a number of years just the Internet Governance and uh, looking at how, how um, the multi-stakeholder approach applies to Internet Governance, uh, I think gives us some uh, food for thought in, when we think about how it applies and uh, the challenges that we'll have in applying it to the field, more specific field, I think, of cybersecurity. Um, and why I'm, I think that in internet governance, for those of you here who, who are IG, uh, familiar with the IG space, um, we kind of tend to see, as a, as a community, we tend to see multi-stakeholderism, um, the multi-stakeholder approach as part and parcel 
of internet governance. And that's how the internet was developed. Um, the fact that uh, that's how the, we have the domain names and numbers managed in the ICANN system. And so I think the inclusive approach is almost ingrained and taken for granted if you come from the IG space. So when we started, uh, started and there are a number of use cases and good examples of how that works in IG. So when we started working on cybersecurity though and said, of course, you know, the, this is part of internet governance if you think about it kind of, if you think uh, of internet governance in a broader space or in a broader, um, I, I guess, conceptual uh, way, um, is that the, the level of, or the kind of normative principles that underpin internet governance are not necessarily the same normative principles that underpin some of these conversations that discuss cybersecurity. So that was something, that was the first um, the, the kind of learning point for me when I entered the field. And uh, um, I think there, the, the maturity of the conversation and the, of, about multi-stakeholderism in IG has advanced much more and has been around in IG space for so long. Um, that uh, compared to cybersecurity, and I think we're still at a lower level of maturity and sophistication when it comes to applying it to cybersecurity discussions. So I think the and that's the first challenge that I want to want to note. I think we're still learning how to do this. The cybersecurity space brings with it specific uh, actors, um, and. I mean, I think a hint is in the name. Um, I think cybersecurity, and the, when we start talking about security, um, that means that a lot of the times the discussions are relatively securitized. You have a, an, and, and that's completely understandable, but what that means is that um, our, um, I, I think, kind of the taken for granted approach that, you know, everyone should be involved in this conversation is not necessarily what some of these, some of the security actors or, you know, if you, if you bring in the defense or intelligence services would, would how they would see um, how their work should be done. Um, so that's one, I think, and, but we're progressing, but that's one of the biggest challenges. The nature of the issue and the nature of the actors involved poses specific challenges when it comes to implementing the approach. Um, and, and just secondly, and, the, the, it's a, and it will be very short on this, the second is, and related to that, is the practical issue of a lack of practical guidance of implementing this approach. But we can come back perhaps to that, but I sure. want to kind of point no, no, these no, no. two things. Actually, Payne, they will advocate, maybe it should not be good to continue with the same secu uh, how say securitized language, but maybe in a more gentle or humanitarian <laughs> way because maybe a police or a law enforcement official uh, at the end it will be uh, his job will be maybe to you know to to sell security but maybe he could sell it in a in a different way could, that could be a possibility or no you yes yes <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure i, I, I like I, because of course uh, it, the language is on security. Uh, it it's, will be very difficult, or I think it's, it's right now it's very difficult. So it's how what's the proposal uh, to to change that language? You say that the language, the discussions are really securitized. Right. So, what could be the proposal for to overcome that that challenge? I mean, I think that the inclusive approach yeah. is the solution to that. In a way, by bringing in actors who can bring in different approaches, you can offset that trend. So, I would say actually the approach is the solution to okay. uh, to, to the to the problem. Perfect. Uh, Caroline, Kaya. Yes, I've, I've my, the first point on my list um, regarding challenges is different language. Um, it's a bit like what you're saying that there, um, yeah, um, cybersecurity hasn't been traditionally a winning theme in the internet, internet governance world. Uh, I think it's remarkable how cybersecurity, cybersecurity became a theme over the last three IGFs. I remember my first IGF was in Brazil and cybersecurity was one among, was on a list quite late, um, I think it's a completely different um, um, issue um, this this, um, this year. And I think that's one of maybe the major challenges there are new actors in the field who suddenly, ha who maybe traditionally were not talking about to each other, but now they kind of have to come together and to talk about those things. Um, 
um, and that's something I think is a challenge not like on I think on the global level but also like what we observe in the assessment that also on the country level some the actors don't know of each other probably they don't know even from of other actors in the same re, um, realm so there's a lot of um, language problems but also uh, my next point awareness awareness among policymakers what does it actually what is cybersecurity what does it mean um, I mean there was a lot of like sea search are so much discussed it's, uh, IGF is, is very interesting and it already shows that uh, people like different groups talking to each other again that's also a problem on the global level but also um, what we observe in the countries um, and um, three that's maybe also a little bit like what um, is very strongly connected to what I said earlier is the lack of existing relationships and yeah there are people like different actors don't know actually what are they doing they don't maybe also a bit yeah it's a different kind of environment and I think there are big gaps which have to be closed to be able to cooperate and what do you think maybe the academia could, could do filling those those lack of awareness or, or those gaps in, in not just in the UK of course of course it's a really top and well-known university worldwide, but maybe in yeah. those developing countries, uh, what, what do you think could be the potential role for the, for the academic institutions? I think it's also like um, doing like looking for evidence and looking also what is um, uh, kind of doing the research and bringing stakeholders together. Raising awareness um, is very important across, uh, across government, but also across different stakeholder groups, across women rights, peop um, people working on women rights, so people must become aware and like understand what it's about. Um, I think it's very important that um, yeah to include all those stakeholders and allow them to be part of the discussion and um, of course giving some ownership and coordination. I think work with all these kind of gaps by coordinating by um, bringing everyone talking in the same language kind of brings also overcomes these global challenges which um, Chris Painter also mentioned. So. Thank you, Kaya. Okay. Um, I would actually agree with a lot of what you said. I think the, the, there are definitely challenges in terms of language, I think. I think there, you know, I, when we engage, I, I think we see probably three different areas conflated. You know, you get the content regulation, you get network security, and then um, add another one. So no, I, uh, law enforcement, cybercrime. I kind of all get like mixed up as one. And I think the, and it, it is some, some of it is sort of different communities coming together. Um, and some of it is maybe in the, just the, the way the words translate into different languages don't necessarily uh, work or is, uh, the cultural interpretation of some, what some of those are are different. And I think that actually makes the discussion more difficult. I think that also we, the UK and, um, and us sort of pulled together a workshop. I think Lara was there as well uh, in Berlin like a few, uh, yeah. a couple months back. Uh, we are, uh, you know, we brought together the development community, so the, the internet access people, and we were like, maybe security should be there at the beginning. And it was interesting just from, a, you know, like at the end of the day, I think there was a clear, like almost a break where all the security people were like, we feel we've gone really a long way towards talking your language. And the development people were like, this is completely dominated by security. So it was, it was, it was just, it was a very, actually a very useful workshop I felt because it was, it like, it, it, it forced the people to talk together. Um, I think in terms of uh, it's sort of just security and it being by, by very nature a little bit more close to uh, access than sort of some of the traditional internet governance issues. I think some of that won't go away. Just some of some of the some of the national security issues that sort of translate into in the internet. I think will stay, but I think it's also the question how countries deal with it. And I think both sort of Spain with its I think the recent consultation on the network information di security directive was open, or sort of I think the NIST cybersecurity framework in the U.S. that sort of. The, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> the the really really detailed um, and wide ranging consultation is not just in, with it, with U.S. entities, private and public and civil society, but with international participation. I think it's the best practice that we encourage everybody around the world to look at. 
So, um, so I think there's things that can be done. There's still stuff that, that you know, we'll, there's a long way to go, but there's definitely, you know, best practices there that we should embrace. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks. I think one of the biggest challenges is probably the most fundamental thing, which is the dynamism of the internet and the ever-evolving um, landscape with which we're dealing. So it makes it very hard to say, oh, here's your cybersecurity solution package. Just go implement that. Um, so even though, even if you have a toolbox or some kind of uh, methodology that you um, are espousing or has worked for you that you are sharing with other people, or um, it's never going to be static. Um, so that I think that's one, one big challenge. We always say it's cyber security is a journey, not a destination in this case. <laughs> Um, and there's a constant need for reassessment. So that needs to be something that's infused into the, the um, solution sets or the, um, or, or the training or capacity building that you're doing. Um, clearly the complexity and interconnectedness of cyberspace, not just as a, a medium, but also I think when you were talking about language, you were talking more about the terminology. I also think that the various aspects of what we call cyber, everything from um, you know, network security to international security to cyber crime to um, uh, cyber bullying, say. I mean, there's a whole list of things that fall into uh, what is a cyber security or a cyber category, and that makes it also uh, a very disparate um, set of issues that you're trying to deal with any, in, in any uh, discussion. Um, I think someone mentioned the, the lack of relationships, and I think what's important about it, that is not only, you know, who do you call, who are your, um, who are the um, interlocutors that you can engage with, but also being able to build up um, the trust uh, and the long-term sort of relationships, it, it, not necessarily between individuals, although I know that that's, you know, certainly ab absolutely one of the, the trust that has built up on the internet, but there's got to be some way to um, uh, make that repeatable or make it built into the system a little bit more. I, I'll just mention two things that um, that you know we're not starting from zero in, in a lot of cases, and and we're not starting from a place where no stakeholders have been involved in the in the cybersecurity arena. Um, for example, in the U.S., many years ago, there was a huge recognition that the um, internet was owned, and, you know, it, our critical infrastructure, including our ICT systems and our telecommunication systems, were owned and operated by the majority by the private sector. So there was no way that any government-only solution was going to work, and we established a whole framework for dealing with each of the critical infrastructures in a um, in a collaborative manner. Um, so it, the, that need, uh, I think, remains and is only getting stronger to build, build those pieces. And then I would say that we dealt with them all in separate sectors, but that also became sort of, um, that has become more and more untenable because not only are sectors sort of blurring, but also the interdependencies between sectors um, are so crucial that you really can't stay in those silos. So I think that's... Um, um, bringing those disparate types together and, and different folks that may never have have, inter have never connected before. Um, and I think the, Chris mentioned the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise. I think that's one, a good goal for them uh, to do that on a more global basis than sort of just the national context in which I was talking about. Um, uh, the other sort of more recent example is the development of the NIST cybersecurity framework that you mentioned, um, which was a very bottom-up process. It was convened by um, our National Institute for Standards and Technology, um, but it was fueled by stakeholders from the uh, private sector, academia, technical community to pull together, compile a set of standards and practices not that you or you or you need to do this this set, you need to do these all, but you need to figure out of that menu what works for you. And that has a whole methodology, and that's going through a view now. So again, it's not like the first, the, this framework was done at you know 1.0. Um, they're re, 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 reviewing that and uh, taking input into that now. So that's another example of sort of that iterative process. Felix? Yes. Um, 
We should remember uh, that uh, governing information security is more uh, difficult than managing any other uh, dual-use technology uh, because of the ubiquity, because the dependence of the uh, economic activity, the daily life of all the people. Uh, if you don't have confidence on the technology, uh, you don't have any opportunity to benefit from the opportunities of the information technologies for your development as a person, as a consumer, of course. Uh, the dependence of the society is, is the key. But the first <coughs> challenge is uh, the lack of uh, enough knowledge and skills, of course, at the level of the users, but this is talk about rising awareness, that is the first target of our uh, traditional uh, first stage of national strategies for the governments. But the second uh, challenge is uh, the lack of uh, skills uh, that need uh, politic, uh, policies of uh, capacity building and addressing the uh, technical staff, of course, but uh, new stakeholders groups. Um, every year, uh, the Organization of American States and the Government of Spain, we develop an annual campus, uh, on a summer campus, and we have incorporated new uh, sessions of training uh, dedicated to uh, the law enforcement, the uh, law agencies, and uh, we need to provide, of course, this uh, level uh, of knowledge and abilities to, to this kind of new uh, key actors at the level of the public actors. But uh, more uh, than the first stage, at this moment, we are trying to provide new uh, schemes of offering uh, knowledge and uh, skills to new agents. Um, Belisario mentioned before the uh, open uh, online massive courses uh, oriented to small and medium enterprises. We should remember that 99% of key actors in the world of information security are private actors, and these are the enterprises, not only the consumers, the users, and we are facing uh, the problem of uh, this not enough uh, knowledge. And in a perspective of inclusion, uh, we are uh, addressing new objectives, because what's the first problem uh, at the hour of involve more and more people in these efforts, in this common effort to, uh, to provide this, this level of, of acknowledgement. Uh, the first problem is the underrepresentation of the women in cybersecurity. Uh, the yeah, you said it. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. There's a higher sure. percentage on this panel than any <laughs> idea. Yes, yeah, so. yes, of course. <laughs> yes. The, um, less than 10% of all the workforce involved in cybersecurity in Europe are women. And this is the best um, objective we can work for because we are trying to provide an enough offer of uh, trained people to the enterprises, to the public agencies with uh, technical knowledge and competences on cybersecurity. But, well, th this is another topic. But uh, in, uh, as a synthesis, uh, we can uh, say that the most uh, important challenge at this moment is the lack of knowledge and abilities in many of these uh, stakeholders uh, that are uh, more necessary than ever in the development of information security at international level. Right. Yeah, there it goes. Um, a few thoughts. First of all, I would not shy away from using the term cybersecurity. And the reason I say that is because that is such a hot topic now for governments around the world that that's what they're asking for. And you can then slip in everything else under that. So once they, I remember we uh, did this with a lot of the internet freedom programming, is they, you know, a country would ask for cybersecurity because that's what they thought they wanted. And you also want to talk to them about other issues. So it's, a, it's an entree. So I wouldn't change the name to Fluffy Bunny or something like that that would <laughs> seem less threatening. I would I'd probably keep it more, uh, I mean, I, I would make clear that it's beyond just the cybersecurity elements, and I would make clear also that it involves the policy argument, so it's just not how you fix your computer, so I think that's something you were getting at, too. Um, I agree with Liesl on bringing the uh, various um, uh, communities together. 
Uh, I know when I chaired what was then the GA high tech crime group, uh, we brought the CERT community at the first conference and the law enforcement 24-7 network together, and they they each thought each other were completely insane. You know, the law enforcement people thought the CERT guys, they, they never, you know, we don't know what they do and they don't cooperate with us, and the CERT people thought those law enforcement people, they scare us, they're going to take down systems. And building those bridges is important between different communities, both in the security area but even beyond that. Uh, and I think that's reflected also when you try to work with countries to have a multi-stakeholder way of doing some of this, these key things, like you know, in terms of doing national strategies, for instance, uh, we worked closely with Chile in doing that, uh, and and saying, and even though in Chile uh, the uh, effort was led in part by their military, which doesn't, it's not the most inclusive, you know, that's not what you think of as being a multi-stakeholder group. But they had other ministries involved too. They did involve the private sector and civil society, and I heard on day zero someone from Chile saying that their strategy, you know, from civil society saying that was good. You know, they actually did that, so that's that's good, and that's what we want to see more of. Um, and and, uh, and then I think one of the other things I've seen is that a lot of countries we talk about a multi-stakeholder system. A lot of countries don't have any background or history in multi-stakeholder systems. They don't even have a history of dealing with their private sector, let alone dealing with civil society. So there have been times when we've done, and I think this will continue, where you do capacity building, especially with a lot of developing countries who don't, don't have that, that history, they don't have that tradition of actually helping them set up that system, you know, having them actually talk to their private sector and civil society, and that's a pretty big challenge in some places. And so. You know, that's the, the foundational part of actually having this multi-stakeholder involvement. Um, I remember when we did our, our first, one of our first capacity buildings back in 2011 in, um, uh, in Kenya, uh, we were able to bring civil society in. This is a cybersecurity and cybercrime capacity building, but we talked about human rights. We were able to bring industry in. They invented something called M-Pesa, which was more advanced than an online payment system. It was more advanced than the U.S. even had. Um, and that was a helpful modeling, and we try to do that in other ones. So I, th I think that's very useful. Um, the um, the other thing that was mentioned is, is bringing the development people in, and and I think we you know I recently did something I think it was at the World Bank, where they had the development uh, program managers uh, for the key for really water and power, the ones where they saw the connection more more clearly than some of the others. So I think maybe focusing it more on ones, and water and power are big development projects, so see, seeing which ones you can actually influence, because um, one of the issues is in this this area of, and one I think big challenges is, is in this era of limited resources, uh, where I really worry that we're not putting enough funding behind capacity building, because it frankly is foundational to so many other things that if we start pulling the plug on that, in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world, and I think every country is facing this challenge, it's not going to, you know, it's going to have second and third order effects in terms of our policy and other things we're trying to do. And the final thing I'd say is as much as I think the IGF has, you know, started adopting cybersecurity as a theme, you know, I, I still think there's a challenge in getting the right people here. Uh, so, you know, I remember the first time I thought about going to IGF was in 2008, I think it was. It was in India, Hyderabad, I think, at the time. And, and I knew Liesl then. She was telling me why I should go. And I was working at the FBI, and it's like, why the hell would I go to this IGF thing? It has nothing to do with the issues I deal with. They never decide anything. <laughs> it doesn't seem, and she convinced me it was a good thing at the time. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, I, you know, I think that that community, though, doesn't necessarily see the value of these discussions, or thinks simply because it's called the Internet Governance Forum that it has nothing to do with what they do, because it sounds like Internet Governance, right? And it's well beyond that, as we all know. So I think there's been much more success in having tracks on these issues. You have more participants on these issues. But if you look at the day ones, and you see what kind of ministerial and government people show up, it's almost always the ICT ministers who don't have any, often don't have any security uh, responsibility. So. You know, you have to figure out how to get these different communities to come together and not have it simply talked about here, but maybe bring some of those other communities in here at a higher level and, and look at other places to do it. So um, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, before and I this is an important forum. I'm not at all <laughs> diminishing this forum. Be, I just think be, we need to make before it. I go to, to the questions to the public, I want to, I, I want actually to, to get the, uh, another impression from you from actually from from one topic that was raised by, by Felix, 
Actually, this year at the GFC, we launched uh, an initiative on, on general cybersecurity. Uh, actually, Lia participated in, in one activity that we had in, in Spain with, with INCIBE. Uh, and I would actually would like to ask your impressions, uh, or, the, or whoever the panelists want, want to, to, to say, because although the, the topic of the panel is uh, inclusive, uh, more inclusive uh, participation is not just the stakeholders, but actually gender inclusion uh, in capacity building. Uh, to give you a, a clear example, yesterday we opened this call for, for this open and online course, totally free, uh, totally available to anyone from anyone in, in the world, particularly in the Americas. Uh, we have around 600, but uh, 600 registers, but right now we have only 15% are, are, are women. Of course, I see the, 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 there is a good diversity on, on ages and, and countries, but uh, for us it's really, really uh, shocking that we are not able to move on uh, on more gender uh, diversity and sometimes uh, certain countries or, or certain uh, uh, regions or, uh, or certain social groups being more uh, uh, participative of, of these issues. So I would like to, to see if any of you have any, um, yeah, any, any perceptions of maybe uh, what else uh, governments or private sector or civil society uh, should do or what should we do together maybe to tackle uh, this issue because for me, was is still really, really shocking that this morning I, I, I see these numbers. You say, it's like, uh, why? Like, uh, I still don't, don't, don't understand. So <coughs> maybe if I just start, I, sure. I would. I, I think it's. I mean, it's obviously a problem. It's a pro problem across the tech sector, but I think it's also not a problem that will be solved like in a year, right? Mm -hmm. I think we we need to like literally start educating. I think in this particular case, girls, but I think across the board, uh, small children um, on cybersecurity and awareness, right? I think even, you know, if you go up to university, like when by the time girls decide to go to university to study ICT or ICT slash with cybersecurity or specific cybersecurity, at, at that point, it's, it's too late. You lost them, right? They've decided what they're going to do a lot earlier on a lot of the times. So I think it's, it's, more like a marathon than something that we'll see a solution immediately. But I think it, we all should work together. I just want to say. You want to? Sure, please. I I'm, want I'm to maybe slightly diff sure, sure. different view on this. No, I, I agree with that. I just think we need to be more precise about what we're talking about. If, we, if you're just saying, you know, inclusion for the sake of inclusion, I think that's fine. But it, if we're focusing on securing the network and solving cybersecurity issues, um, you know, it's, it's how you pose the problem. Are we talking about uh, lack of inclusion as a problem in itself, or are we trying to say, you know, how do we actually, how do we actually solve cybersecurity issues? And I think we had conversations about, uh, similar conversations about um, human rights, and you know, like just saying that you, that cybersecurity needs to be human rights respecting, um, in and of itself doesn't really help anyone solve a cybersecurity problem if we don't dig deeper. Um, and I, I, th I really want to, like, our approach is that um, there is no one size fits all when it comes to cybersecurity. There isn't, like, a number. Uh, if, if we're thinking about developing policy, there isn't a number of women or men or stakeholder groups that you need to involve, and then, therefore, you will have... Um, <laughs> it happens to everyone. It happened to me earlier. It's, uh, um, but you know what I mean? So it's, I, I think it's important to say that, that there is no like a set of um, a, a number that you, like if we were all women on this panel, would that make it a more, uh, like a better outcome? I don't necessarily think so, right? So that I think inclusion does not just mean like a, a set of, uh, like a set formula. Sure. If you have women, then you solve cybersecurity issues. I don't think that's right. And I think the, the solution is much more holistic. What Kaya was talking about, we need to, you know, and solving the gender disparity does not come from like having an all female panel, Definitely. right? It, it's a much more holistic approach that we need across like all issues in society. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. I don't know if the audience uh, would like to uh, make any comments or questions to, to, to the panelists. We still have a couple of minutes. 
please. Uh, David from Switzerland. I work with uh, in critical infrastructure protection. I have two questions. One um, or one question, one remark. Um, legal in, in enforcement agencies. Um, how we've been discussing a lot in the last two days about uh, lawful interception and this kind of things. But another point is actually of if I am a victim of a ransomware, where can I go file a complaint? And that we have those statistics. That seems one thing that is sort of the positive side that we are a bit missing. Then um, a second one, we want to build capacity, but we need, um, so we want to build universities and these kind of programs, but we also need people from other domains, not just technicians that are only going to do IG, but that can sort of come from different areas and get quickly into a feel and a groove of what we're discussing about in cybersecurity. So do you have any, um, Inputs on that. Thank you. Well, on the on the reporting one, yeah. I mean, I think that that's fair. I mean, I think that in, in you know with ransomware and other things, one of the things that you, know, you could argue is that you actually law enforcement, if they're doing their job correctly, is privacy protecting because they keep you know, for instance, theft of PII, they keep it more uh, restrained by actually getting the bad guys. Uh, it's a challenge because every country is still trying to figure out how to deal with it. In the U.S., there's no one number you call for all things. There, there's a couple things like the Internet Fraud Complaint Center, the FBI runs, and there's some things like that that aggregates a lot of these smaller cases because, you know, if, if you have a small case and you go to the FBI, that's a small case. But if they aggregate it in term of, terms of, and it tends not to be a national or, or global scheme, which it often is, that that helps. And I think other countries are trying to do that, too. So I think there needs to be better education between law enforcement and the public about that. On, on the second issue, you know, I think that goes to another point, is it's not just the technical people, as you said, you need. Uh, people have asked me, you know, what's the career path to do cyber policy? There is no career path to do cyber policy. I think people, all the people who've done it uh, on this panel and around this room, I think have all pursued different ways of doing it. I'm a recovering lawyer, for instance, and, and so I think people have come from different ways of doing it. Um, that's changing a little bit because there are a number of schools and universities that are setting up policy programs in this, and, I, and in the U.S. certainly, but I've seen that in other places as well. Um, but I think you also benefit from having people coming from different perspectives in this space. I don't think you just want that technical perspective. I think one of the problems is people, you know, it, it, you know, when senior policymakers say this is just a technical issue and write it off, they don't understand the larger dimensions. So you need those people to make that translation. In Spain, we have a hotline. Uh, we have a telephone. Uh, every citizen can call for help uh, if he, he's uh, attacked or he has any doubt about the impact of a um, global uh, threat to at the level of in the strategic industries, at the level of inf critical infrastructures, of course, but in other areas. So we, we, ha we provide a um, full uh, portfolio of services to citizens and enterprises. And, uh, in many countries in the European Union, we are advancing in, in this uh, sense. Yeah. Anybody want to add something else? Sure. Um, I would like to add something which also relates to what Kaya and Leah said earlier. I think it's inclusion is not shouldn't be for the sake of inclusion, but it's important to very early include cybersecurity in the education framework because I think if you spark interest, you also get the best talent and girls who often maybe drop out of high school a bit earlier because of different reasons, in particular in poor countries, um, that they are so maybe there's some interest, interest sparked for these issues and then they go into those fields. Not only good for the cybersecurity field because you get the talent, but also for, of course, for the girls and women later. So I think having this from the very early beginning as an issue, not only for, um, creating the talent over time, but also having like awareness and the skills in, in the, for those people. Um, the second thing, oh yeah, I, just by the way, I, I did a BA in literature, German literature of the Baroque times, so somehow <laughs> I ended up here. So, it, I mean, there are different ways. <laughs> um, and the other thing is like about reporting. I think that a lot of like, um, what's very important is to yeah, have mechanisms to report those things, which are, very easy to for everyone, for citizen children, um, 
women, also other, all other groups as well. I mean, there are other marginalized groups as well who should go to get into this field and also be able to report. Um, so, um, yeah, there are different mechanisms which should be are important for the country to have to offer to their citizens and businesses. Thank you. Lisa. So I think even if there is a number to call, I'd be interested in if ever all the citizens of Spain know the number to call. I think that's an interesting question. Um, I think many people probably think about calling their provider first of all, and you know, no offense, but probably get put on hold at least. <laughs> um, or do you just call, you know, whatever your emergency hotline is, you know, whether it's 911 in the U.S. or whatever. I think that's a it's an it's an important question, um, but n not just about the number to call, but just as awareness generally and education generally, um, two things. We have a uh, awareness program in the United States. I think they have been here this week, uh, National Cybersecurity Alliance, and they put out a number of um, um, uh, guidance and advice for various types of end users for you know, how to protect yourselves online. I used to be affiliated with that program, and one thing we tried to do many or 10 years ago was to get like a smoky bear you know, anti-fire, you know, protect forest fires type of campaign, and it has been an uphill battle, and we've never achieved that, but it could be something like that. But I will say, I'm really glad to see that the Girl Scouts now have a cybersecurity badge. Yeah. yeah. They do. Yeah. Actually, I still remember the Metro campaign uh, from Stop <laughs> <laughs> No, they, they actually, yeah, and CSA has done a uh, really, really good job, and, and we're actually very proud to, to partner with uh, with them, not in, in all the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Vlad, I think you you had a couple of questions. Thanks, Belisario. <coughs> Vladimir Radonovic from Diplo Foundation. So, uh, a quick comment on, on, uh, on the profession. Uh, I spoke with a, a colleague from uh, Simon Tech at some point, and I asked him, so uh, how do you recruit people? What, do you, what are you looking for, engineers or lawyers or, you know, what kind of skills? And he said, what I'm looking is passion. This is the only thing I need. I need a passion from the person for cybersecurity. So it's interesting how the private sector sees that because it's a, it's a totally multidisciplinary uh, complex. But a cu couple of experiences from, from what Diplo does in cybersecurity capacity building, which responses to great, great points that you, um, <coughs> all of you raised. <coughs> so something that we found that works or helps, one is a holistic and a multidisciplinary approach, because that also helps, uh, and uh, Chris mentioned that, that, you can also put human rights, but not, not only that, on different layers, so different aspects of uh, cybersecurity, technical, policy, uh, national, international mechanisms, uh, international relations, and so on, but then also relations uh, of cybersecurity with economy and human rights, but then also soft skills. Uh, such as cross-professional communication. That's something that's a big, big issue. Uh, and if, if we approach that way, then all the different stakeholders that we involve feel comfortable at least in one bit of that discussion. And then they're eager to learn in the others that they don't know about. So this helps also the inclusiveness. Then the format needs to be um, exchange and engagement. It can't be uh, off the shelf of ex cathedra or something that's, you know, we are teaching and preaching. It really has to engage people because everyone has, again, something to share and that drives people from different stakeholders uh, to share. Then it, we need to, and you mentioned that already, we need to uh, turn from uh, people-centric capacity building, which is important, to institutional capacity building. And that's much longer, much, much more complex, but more sustainable process. Then it needs to be a global, um, wherever it's possible, a global um, exchange of opinions. And that's where definitely, as you mentioned, uh, online courses help. We have a lot of experience with that, and it really helps uh, exchanging views from different countries. And lastly, um, sometimes we think of capacity building as a simple, simple training or simple course, but it's actually a, 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 a way comprehensive process which usually lasts for a year, two years, three years. Uh, it, it's compiled of different, different bits and pieces. So the course is one, um, uh, research is another possible component, um, fellowships, policy immersion. We used to have uh, IGF fellowships uh, to bring people to the IGF, to other fora. We have less and less of that. And even if we have that, we bring people that might not have gone through some of the capacity building programs. So that should be sort of a combination, maybe for some of the next IGFs we can think of compre comprehensive capacity building programs and then fellowship fellowships to bring people to the IGF or GFC and so on and so forth. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, be careful with passion, huh? Because uh, it could be problematic sometimes as a Colombian, I can tell. Uh, any other comment or uh, uh, question from, from the floor? 
please. Thank you, Belly. Um, I'm Patrick Pavlag. I work for the EU Institute for Security Studies in Brussels. And uh, we are currently conducting a project um, for the European Commission on operational guidelines on cybersecurity capacity building. So a lot of things that you have mentioned are really very close to w what we're trying to figure out. Um, and I would like to throw on the table one issue that didn't come up with this panel, but I have heard in many other discussions uh, here during the IGF, which is the principle of uh, do no harm, which is the very basic principle in development community. And when we talk about capacity building, it is exactly development work that we're talking about. Um, and I'm wondering if this, you know, what, what your views on that are, but where do we actually draw the line when we talk about cybersecurity capacity building? One of the main things that was raised in many of the panels on encryption, for instance, is that you know this contradiction between uh, encryption and uh, law enforcement access to evidence cannot be really reconciled from the technology perspective. And so it seems to me that the technology community and policy community are completely at odds uh, when it comes to what can be done and what is possible to be done. At the same time, law enforcement capacity building and us doing the trainings in fair countries is actually one of the most common activities that is uh, implemented. It's the lowest hanging fruit, I think, of all possible initiatives that you have out there. So I'm just wondering to what extent can we go and you know, do projects um, that actually tackle issues to which we ourselves do not have answers yet. So when we go and engage in building ca law enforcement capacity building, in uh, Africa or Asia or even Latin America uh, and you know, provide tools to law enforcement agencies on how to access the evidence from uh, private companies and so on. Uh, aren't we actually creating more problem down the road? Uh, how can we then uh, go and start answering those policy questions in those countries to which we actually have not answered ourselves? Uh, where is this line at which maybe we should say, you know what, actually maybe this is not such a bad idea. We haven't figured it out ourselves. Let's take a step back, try to kind of create a very safe environment around a specific issue and only then engage. How to build those safeguards that would actually uh, make the final outcome and impact actually much more positive than create these negative spillovers. Thank you. This will be a topic for the next IGF, definitely, no? So uh, I will let the, the panelists do. Oh, I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, I think uh, that is a real challenge, and I think the challenge comes when you have regimes who could use these capabilities to, for instance, monitor their own citizens and suppress dissent, and that's a, that's a constant issue. And I think you have to look at who the uh, recipient is of the services and the capacity building you want to do when you have to, you know, to the best of your ability, make sure that it's not being used for that. At the same time, you know, I don't think we just sit back and wait in terms of building capacity to fight cybercrime or, or to deal with cybersecurity because, uh, because of the weakest link problem, that that actually will hurt all of us if we, if we don't do that. So, so it's a balance. I don't think if we wait till we settle the encryption debate, that will be until well after I die, I think, you know, so I think that that because they're, they're really, it's almost intractable. They're really good arguments on both sides. Um, we have done, there has been some efforts made, uh, for instance, sometimes export licenses are required for certain kinds of things, and sometimes those are denied for countries who are gonna be using services for uh, that kind of suppression or monitoring of citizens, but there's a lot of vendors out there who do that anyway, and one way that that was tried to um, be uh, dealt with not very successfully, it was through Vassanar uh, a, a while ago, where Vassanar, people don't know this, this is sort of the, um, the uh, loose group of a number of countries who look at export uh, issues and export control issues and try to come up with some controls dealing with cyber tools. Uh, the problem was there was a lot of problems doing that because these are dual use tools and you don't want to actually penalize the ability to have cybersecurity products shipped. Uh, but the purpose of it was to keep you know, tools that be used either to attack other countries or to monitor citizens to go out. And, and that's been a very difficult issue to deal with. So I, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. Anybody else? Please. Uh, oh, go ahead. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think just, I'd just like to go back to the point I made um, on the attempt to make an approach of, a um, whole of government approach to capacity building. Um, 
so that the cybercrime training for prosecutors or for law enforcement officials um, is has some infused uh, uh, content from sort of the policy side or the human rights side or um, you know the folks dealing with other aspects of cybersecurity. Now, I'm not saying we have this perfect at all, but we do have um, sort of existing mechanisms for having those conversations. Not only because sometimes we use the the cybercrime office at State Department's money to do some of our capacity building. So that in that cross multidisciplinary way of approaching capacity building is, is one way to think about it. Also, I think an important part about capacity building is to say, you know, we don't have this resolved yet because these are such tricky, sticky issues and we're having a very robust debate about it back here at home. Um, and, you know, maybe you should too before you put in place any uh, policies that would, could, could break it one way or the other. Thank you. Kaya? Um, so I think I would agree with uh, both what Chris and Lizu have said. I think um, also thank you, Chris, for mentioning uh, one process that is completely close to multi-stakeholderism <laughs> <laughs> uh, with Wassenaar there. Uh, but I think in terms of, um, you know, it, it's a challenging issue and I think to be honest, probably across cybersecurity, you can't say, to sort of to Liz's point, point earlier, you can't say it's, it, it's been solved. It's a continuous, technology develops so fast. It's a continuous push for improvement. And you you know, like if you look at pretty much any country that has sort of early on adopted, whether strategies, whether different frameworks or in, created institutions to manage cybersecurity, They've evolved over time. Like right? they've looked at them every two, three years, and we're like, "Oh, this doesn't work. Let's change it." Right. So I think there are some intrinsically difficult questions that I think we'll have to muddle through, I guess. But I think um, if you think about how quickly um, countries, communities everywhere are connecting and connecting to an increasingly different innovative ways and how quickly the threat landscape is expanding, I think just stopping and not doing not anything is really not an option. Can I just add something on, on the Boston I think, I, you know, I think that was really well intended. I think because of the second order consequences, there were really challenges to that. There was kind of a blunt tool that really didn't work as well as people thought it would. So that, that was the challenge, but we need to find creative solutions. on. And I agree with you know what Liesl said is in a lot of the capacity building I've seen, you know the ones that the State Department has done, um, there's someone from our Democracy and Human Rights uh, group who or my our our country is not mine, uh, who um, who would actually who would actually be there and would give a talk about you know, rule of law and and you know human rights online and that was part of it and then. I remember at the IGF a couple of years ago meeting with a number of civil society people who were concerned that these national strategies that we were all promoting were being done to, you know, in a way that was not including the human rights community and it was trying to actually, it was a proxy for, for um, uh, suppressing human rights. And I think uh, that's why I think it's important as we do these outreach things to make sure that, that the processes for creating these sort of documents include all the different sectors so you at least have some attempt to build that in. Please. Well, maybe just briefly, and the, uh, one thing that, that you could consider as well is uh, uh, thinking about redefining cybersecurity in a way that's focused on people from the outset, right? So that it's people centric. A lot of the definitions of cybersecurity that you have at the moment that like, focus on on the security of systems, of networks, so this that, which is which is fine. But what what you often what often gets lost is, is the fact that in the end you want to protect the systems and the data and the networks in order to protect people. Um, and, um, you know, if we, th there's um, a, a, a definition on cybersecurity that was developed in a multi-stakeholder way by a working group of the Freedom Online Coalition that actually does define cybersecurity in that way. And I think that if you underpin the understanding of, of cybersecurity as being something that's, that's people-centric, that's kind of a, uh, my go away in, in what Patrick was, was, was talking about. Felix? Yes, uh, from our experience, uh, be sure that our capacity building initiatives uh, 
at the level of European countries and American countries, uh, our programs with the Organization of American States, uh, always uh, we dedicate a m very important portion of our effort to preserve questions about democracy, civil liberties, free enterprise, all the questions related to democracy in the uh, practice in the day by day of, of uh, professionals uh, in cyber security. So, um, in other international forums, uh, there is a discussion about the offensive or defensive uh, uh, actions uh, or attitudes, uh, or attitudes, best, best word, uh, when you are facing uh, threats. But in any case, um, uh, be sure that our programs are dedicated to uh, enhance uh, to the technical staff to understand the importance to uh, keep the democracy good practices in uh, the, the daily life, in, the, in their jobs. Okay. Thank you, Patrick, for putting a spicy to the conversation. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there is any other question from, from the floor, or comment. Um, otherwise, I will, if not, I will uh, let the opportunity to, to the panelists to see if you have any final comments to wrap up the, uh, the session. As we know, it's, uh, we are very close to, to lunch, and <laughs> you and the audience should really be hungry. So, we are <laughs> so I don't know if, if you have any final questions, feel, feel free. It's the moment. Hola, hola. Oh. No, so I just would like to add one thing because I think it wasn't mentioned. It's also like the um, benefit of regional approaches yeah. and having focus on region and getting both capacity building on a regional level but also um, knowledge transfer, awareness building on a regional level because there, there's a lot of cultural aspects in these approaches but also in like um, assessing cybersecurity capacity and developing solutions and it must come from the regions because it's also where already relationships exist and a certain kind of trust already exists and it probably, yeah, maybe decreases a little bit of the efforts in the beginning to start certain things and because they're already existing efforts. Perfect. Well, uh, with that I would like to, to thank you, all of you, for, for your participation. We will definitely try to, to share the report of the, of the session with we, with uh, all of you, and hopefully we will see you uh, in the next IGF on um, behalf of the OAS, and I'm sure Global uh, Digital would like to thank the, the speakers today and, and all of you. Thank you very much. Adjourn. <laughs> <laughs>